right, good morning, everybody. Good to be back with you. Uh, it's been three weeks since I've been with you guys on a Sunday morning. Um, so two weeks ago I had COVID, and last week I was doing my last gospel meeting for the year. It's good to be home, good to be here for a while. I won't be traveling for a while. And so we're going to be continuing looking at Psalms in uh, Psalms 9 through 11 this morning. And the material for the next couple classes is back there. I'll, if we have time, I'll say something more about it at the end. But beginning next Sunday morning, the approach to these classes is going to be a little bit different. Where with every psalm, we're going to be asking the same four questions. And a lot of this is going to, a lot of the class discussion is going to be dependent on how much everybody prepares and gets ready for those classes. But um, I'll have my last PowerPoint slide for today. We'll have what those four questions are that we're going to ask for every psalm for the rest of these classes. So, Lord willing. Um, all right, so just as a reminder, uh, the book of Psalms is broken up into five books. It, it has more chapters than any other book of the Bible. And so for this quarter, we're looking at book one of the Psalms. And sometime next year, Lord willing, we'll look at book two. And then the following year, books three and four in the same quarter. And then the uh, final year of this will be uh, book five. And so we're doing this once a year for the next few years. I'll, I'll rem remind us that... One of the reasons, one of the benefits, I think, of studying the Psalms can be seen in this passage in Ephesians 5, where it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We asked the question before, why is it that people get drunk? Why is it that people go to substances? What are they trying to find from those things? Escape. Escape some degree of momentary peace or something like that. And uh, rather than going to something like wine or any kind of form of escapism that makes you forget about what's happening in life, he says to be filled with, with books like the Psalms, which help you learn how to look at things from the right perspective. And so more than any other book of the Bible, perhaps, we have in the book of Psalms, people processing their difficulties and their life trials with God rather than with drugs or with Netflix or with what, whatever it else it might be in somebody's life. And so how do you deal with life's trials and difficulties? Now, so far in the book of Psalms, beginning around Psalm 11, we've seen David, who's writing all of the first book of Psalms, we're seeing him deal with all kinds of enemies. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But let me say a couple things to get us oriented to what we're looking at in this class. Psalms 9 and 10 go together. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Psalm 10 has no heading in it. Um, like if you look at the heading of Psalm 9, it says to the choir master, according to Muth Laban, Laban or something, a Psalm of David. There's no heading in Psalm 10. Not all Psalms have headings, but that's one reason that you could see how these two go together. But here's another reason. Psalm 9 ends with the word Selah or Selah, and that is never used in other psalms to end a psalm. It's always a pause in the middle of a psalm. And so, uh, and then also the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, puts Psalm 9 and 10 together as one psalm. And so uh, perhaps they were divided up because otherwise it would be a very, very long psalm. But if we include Psalm 11 in what we're looking at right now, the themes of what we're looking at in this class is you're going to see a lot of things about David having enemies, like we said before, and also God's judgment of those enemies. Threaded throughout all three of these psalms, those two themes you're going to see happen several times. Now let me ask this question. David was a man after God's own heart. Why would a godly person ever have enemies or people that are antagonistic against them? Yeah, um, people are not always going to appreciate the truth. People aren't going to appreciate the gospel. And so if you're trying to share those kinds of things with people and you're standing up for what's right, there's going to be people that don't appreciate that. So you can understand why a godly person would have people that are against them. David, almost all of these psalms in the first book are dealing with that idea in one way or another. So you're in good company if it's indeed for righteousness sake that you're being persecuted. But look at this other question here. 
What are some ungodly ways we might respond to foes and enemies in our lives? Because we're about to read through three psalms where David is saying, this is how I handled it. What are some bad ways to respond to adversaries in your life? Try to retaliate? Good. What else? Over here. Hurting them in some way? Yeah. Exercising vengeance? What else? Yeah, you, you hold malice in your heart. You, you, you might not be the one that wants to hurt them, but if you see them get hurt, you're sure going to be happy about that. What else? Yeah, gossip about it. And so, what, or you could go to wine, or you could binge on a, all kinds of things that make you forget all about all the things that you have to deal with. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at in Psalms 9 through 11 is David showing how he handled this. So look at Psalm 9. And I'll just set, I want to show you one of the latter verses of this chapter, or one of the middle verses. Look at verse 13, just so you understand what David is going through. Psalm 9, verse 13. Be gracious to me, O Lord, see my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death. All right, what is David going through according to verse 13? Yeah, there's people that are trying to kill him. There's people that are afflicting him. I don't know if you've ever had anybody literally try to kill you. Maybe you've had times where it felt like people were trying to kill you. Um, but how, what's David going to do here? So look at verses 1 and 2 just to get started. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will praise, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. All right, so notice three times in these two verses, I will, I will, I will. The first one where he says, I'm going to give thanks to the Lord. Um, how much of, his, of David's heart is he going to use to give thanks to the Lord? His whole heart, not half of it, not, not even three quarters of it. You know, that, that's 75% is quite a bit. He says, I'm going to do it with my whole heart. Uh, despite what's going on in his life. Can you be somebody who still gives thanks to, to the Lord, even if somebody was trying to kill you? Yeah, because we're supposed to rejoice in the Lord always. So he's gonna, he begins the psalm with that idea. He also says, I'm going to recount all of your wonderful deeds. Now, do you think if somebody was going through some serious difficulty in their life that you might easily forget all the wonderful things that God has done? It would be really easy to just stop thinking about that. By the way, one of the things that we'll see as we study through the Psalms in the next few years um, <clears throat> is the evangelistic heart of King David. He's always wanting to tell everybody about what the Lord has done and how great God is. Have you ever noticed before that in the New Testament, there's not a bunch of verses that Paul wrote that says, you guys need to be more evangelistic. You need to be more evangelistic. No, no. Um, evangelism in a heart that wants to share what the Lord has done is first just impressed with, the Lord, with what the Lord has done and then the natural result of that is that you'll want to share it with everybody. David has that mindset even though he's going through difficult times. So the last I will here is I will be glad and I will exult in God. Um, he's praising God for himself just for who he is He's not even saying anything here right now about what God has done for him. He's just saying, I'm going to praise and exult in the Lord. And, um, and so that, that's how he begins this. Any thoughts or comments through verse 2? All right, because we're covering three psalms, we're not going to have time to read all of them, uh, all the verses in these psalms, um, especially because I want to spend a little bit more time in Psalm 11 this morning. So verses 3 through 6, what David does is he praises God for his past judgments and how he's rescued him in previous times. But look at verses 7 through 12 where he talks about how God reigns as king. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. All right. 
When he says in this psalm here that God is above the nations, do you remember in Psalm 2 how the nations conspired or they meditated together, how to break the bonds of God apart from them, and then God was going to send his son to be his king. And so throughout these psalms, you got these people that are trying to fight against the anointed one of God, who in the immediate context I think would be David. Uh, And God showing that he's the one who has power over him. And so, uh, remember how Psalm 2 talked about kissing the king, like bow down to him, acknowledge his authority, otherwise he's going to crush you. So, these enemies of David, it's as if they're being warned here that God is the one, he's the one who judges righteously, he's the one who helps the oppressed, you're supposed to flee to him for refuge. (laughs) What physical circumstances might you have to flee to a, a certain structure for refuge. Storms, yeah, like storms or earthquakes, something like that. I remember when I was in Boy Scouts, there, at one of the camps that I was at one year, there was a tornado that had ripped through the area that we were in. And there was this shelter that was all concrete. And it's like it, when you were outside that building, everybody thought that they were going to lose their life. And as soon as you went in that building, there was a lot more security and safety that you have. For God to be a refuge, which is one of the the themes of these three psalms, shows that if you seek the Lord, whenever you're going through something difficult, he in one way or another will act like a refuge for you. Um, And so, uh, anything else you guys want to say up through verse 12? Comments or questions? By the way, if... A book like the Psalms has a lot of this um, poetic kind of language. I think in our culture, we, we think more logically and, you know, like a letter that Paul wrote is, I think, more in our culture, the kind of things that we can read and try to understand, or it's more normal for us to try to understand something like that. How many of you really like poetry? Some, some of us do. And this is something that I've been thinking about as as I've been thinking through Psalms. But why is it the case that people who go through a lot of difficulties are oftentimes very artistic people? Have you ever noticed that? Like, David here is writing artistic words, and he's going through something extraordinarily difficult. Some of the most artistic painters, like people who could do beautiful artwork, are also people who have lived through extreme trauma in their life. Why is it that so many of the artistic things written in the book of Psalms are coming from people who have been hurt? Yeah. Yes, there's something about being able to express in an artful way what you're going, like what if David just wrote like a, a, a passage like Paul would in the letters, and, and I'm not, like Paul just says, like David just says, hey, hey everyone, um, good uh, grace and peace to all of you, I'm going through a really difficult time right now, I've asked the Lord to help me, and um, I trust in God. It wouldn't have the same impact unless it was written in a poetic form like this. And so poetry and art gives people an outlet for the things that can't be expressed in any other way. And so uh, David is saying all of these. So try to think about that as we go through this. In verses 13 through 20, David is going to plead to God for refuge. And um, in verses 13 and 14, we already looked at verse 13. Why does, God, why does David want to be rescued? Look at verse... Look at verses 13 and 14. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift up from the gates of heaven, uh, the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. In verse 14, why does David care about being rescued? So I can keep praising you. Um, If I were to die... If you were to die, would there be less praise of God in this world? Preserve my life so I can continue telling people about what you've done for me. 
Now, he brings up in verses 15 through 17 how the plans of the nations have backfired. Look at verses 15 to 17. The nations have sunk in the pit that they have made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. Okay, um... If you reject the Lord's anointed, if you reject his rulership over you, it's never going to end up working. But can you think of some other stories in the Bible that show man's plans backfiring, like this passage talks about? Yeah, Herod's trying to kill all the babies in Matthew chapter 2, and it's not successful, and it ends up being one of the reasons that we remember him as being a very wicked person. What other plans in the Bible from wicked people backfire on them? Yeah, you've got Haman, um, which is a great example of of justice being brought back onto you. What else? Oh, good, Tower of Babel. So you've got all these people that are trying to build this great tower up to heaven. And have you ever noticed in Genesis 11, it says that the Lord came down to see what they were doing as if God is looking down from heaven and going, what's that little pimple on earth that the people think is just this great thing? Um, good. And then they end up being scattered. Any other examples you can think of? Yeah, Samson and the Philistines, good. And so there's this concept... Is it okay to pray to the Lord God, please help the plans of wicked people backfire on them? Yeah. Uh, I think you have examples, which is better, by the way, than you saying, I'm going to execute justice. I'm going to take matters into my own hand. No, it's better to pray to the Lord that he take care of these kinds of things rather than I myself go ahead and do it. And so um, the wicked are going to die, but David is rescued from death. And then in verses 18 through 20, it ends with uh, David calling on God to judge the nations again like he has done in the past. All right. Anything else you guys want to say about verse 9? It goes right into Psalm 10. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yep, good, good. And if I, I'll suggest too that if we don't learn poetic ways of talking to God, I don't know that we're going to really be able to process our trauma in our life. Here's David doing that kind of... The more vocabulary we can learn on how to address God in a, in a more artful way when it's just me and God praying... Try learning how to do that and see if it helps you with your anxiety or see if that helps you when you feel oppressed in one way or another. There's something I think that's more powerful about doing that. All right, so Psalm 10. um, Look at what happens in Psalm 10, 1 and 2. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised, like we looked at in 15 to 17. All right. Um, So the opening complaint here, David is being pursued by his enemies. Uh, These people are arrogant, which is one of the ways that the Bible most characterizes wicked people. Um, Which, by the way, can you be an arrogant, prideful person even if you've never um, done all of the really big bad sins in our culture? It, it, um, sometimes people will think, well, as long as I haven't stolen anything or murdered anybody or, you know, I've never slept with anybody who wasn't my spouse or whatever, then that means that I've never done, like, the really big bad sins. What sin throughout the Bible from beginning to end is condemned more than any other, perhaps? Pride and arrogance. Can, what was that? College professors? Oh, the arrogance? Yeah. Well, yeah, Okay. I had some arrogant college professors. We can all have some of that in our hearts, though, even if we haven't done the big bad sins of our culture. So don't ever think that you're better than anybody else if you haven't done those things, because that might actually be the reason for your pride. All right. Um, And so, again, he prays that their schemes would backfire on them. But look at verse 1. Is it okay to go to God and say something like, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Can we pray like that to God? 
How, yeah, Amy? Yes. And I, there, there, there's been times in my life where I did not understand why I was going through the difficulty that I was going through. And that how powerful it can be to go to God and say, God, I don't know why you've brought me to this situation. I don't know why this is happening in my life. Please help me, give me wisdom, things like that. It's okay to be raw and honest with God. And I think that's one of the things that we need to see from the book of Psalms. It's not like we have to get these white gloves on and have all of the perfect language and everything and make sure that we would never suggest anything to God about feeling forsaken. The reason why David can say this He's talking to God. He might feel forsaken, but the fact that he's talking to him knows that he means that he knows God hasn't forsaken him. Otherwise, why talk to him? Yeah, Patty. Yes. Yep. Good. All right. <clears throat> Verses three through eleven give you a portrait like a picture of these people that are oppressing David. I just have one question about these verses. So as I read it, think about these, this question. What descriptions of the wicked are most striking or interesting to you in these verses? What sticks out to you in verses 3 through 11 about these wicked people? I'll go ahead and read this text. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages and in hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God is forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. All right. Here's this really vivid picture of the psychology of the wicked. What do you notice about these verses here? What was that? Yeah, yeah, good. They prey on the weak people. Why would it be, uh, why, if you wanted to be a really wicked person, why would you want to go after weak, uh, weak people? Yeah, it's easier. Like, what are they going to, they, they can't get me back, you know, like, uh, uh, what recourse are they going to have? Good, so it's kind of like a bully at a playground. What else? Yeah, very worldly, uh, very influenced by the ways of the world. What else? Yeah, they, they, they don't have any consciousness of God. Like, God's not going to see. He's not going to hold me accountable. They keep blocking God out of their mind, which allows them to keep doing what they want to do. It, one of the... Do we, is there any part of our heart that at times just doesn't want to believe that there's a God that's going to hold us accountable? I think that's in all of us at times. The times that we justify doing something that we ought not do, the last thing that we're thinking about is what would God think about what I'm doing? And so these people keep blocking that out of their heart, out of their mind, so that they don't have to think about those kinds of things, and then it allows them to go ahead and do what they want to do for that moment. Anything else that you notice here about these people? Yeah, where do you see that? Okay, good. Is that verse 6 in your translation? Uh, yeah. What, what version do you have? NIV. NIV, okay. All right, good. All right, what else do you guys see here? Pride. Yeah, okay, this is an ironic thing about pride. Pride has blinded these people. They don't think that there's any God that I have to answer to. People who are prideful and self-obsessed... They are always thinking about themselves, but the ironic thing in the Bible is that the self-obsessed person doesn't even understand himself. It's the, the only way that you actually come to know who you really are is to compare yourself to God. But if you're always like, me this, and me that, and me this, 
you're the kind of person that's constantly saying and doing things that everybody else is, is like shaking their head at and going, I can't, this person keeps embarrassing themselves, but they think they're hot stuff. So, um, all right, so that's the description of the people that are against David. In verses 12 to 15, David has this petition for God to judge these people. Look at verses 12 to 15. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your, he- your hand, forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. All right. God, so notice in verse 12, what is it that David wants God to lift up? His hand, and then in verse 15, what does he want God to break? An arm. So God can lift up his hand and break what? An arm. Look at, look at how this section begins and ends. What is it that the arm represents in the Bible? What does your arm represent in the Bible? Power and strength. Remember in Isaiah 53, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Like who is the... To who, who's been given the strength of the Lord? And it's Jesus who is somebody that you'd never expect to have the true power of God. And so breaking the arm of man represents man's strength. And like we said, it just takes God's hand to be able to do that. Um, we've already talked about how the wicked think that there's no accountability. And, um, and so uh, we have David calling on God to show that these people will have to answer to the Lord for what they've done. Uh, any comments or questions through verse 15? Yeah, Amy? Yes. Right. Yeah, these wicked people, what is it? Isn't it Ecclesiastes 9 11 that says that because the judgment's not executed speedily, it makes the, the heart of the children of man set to do evil or something like that? Yeah, Wes? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, and th- so a lot of the psalms, like th- if it begins with this utter despair, this psalm is going to end with this certainty that God is going to take care of everything. Like in 16 to 18, and I'm going to loop back into what Wes was just saying. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the, of the affli- afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. God's going to take care of the problem. All right. Have you ever had a time before where you had a really tense conversation with somebody and and both sides had a good heart, but there was something difficult that both that people had to talk about. And the beginning of the conversation starts out kind of tense. And as you open up and you gently, lovingly, but tensely have to talk about some things, How do those conversations end if both sides have a good heart? Yeah, like it was good that we talked it out. That was difficult, but we had to talk about those things, and now we can hug it out, and we're doing a lot better now. So many of the Psalms begin with this tense, like, God, why have you forsaken me? Why is this happening in my life? 
And the process of being raw and honest with God has so many of these psalms end with this confident trust in the Lord. They're just like so many conversations that you might have with people about tense things. Any other comments or questions on that? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yes, and good, this is a good point that, yeah, God wants us to be raw and honest with him, but if we're unrestrained in that, was there anybody in the Bible who started questioning God and saying, if I could have a day in court with you, I would win, God? That's Job, and he has to repent at the end of the book for that. He never curses God like Satan wants him, wants him to at the beginning of the book, but he does go too far in how he challenges God. So you, you do have to have a holy posture before God, but it is okay, and I think one of the ways that we train our instincts on this to know how to talk to God is to look at things like the Psalms. So, very good. All right, let's look at Psalm 11. I, um, I want to spend more time on this one. This Psalm is, is, is so wonderful for so many reasons. Um, what we'll do, I'll start out by reading the first three verses of this. To the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? All right. What is going on in this psalm? I look at verse 1, the first part of verse 1, as David defying advice that he's getting from people. When he says, in the Lord I take refuge. Um, uh, D David currently, when he's writing this, has refuge in the Lord. He trusts in the Lord to protect him. But this is in the context of him getting bad advice. And that's why he says in verse 1, the second half of verse 1... How can you say to my soul, and then does everybody have it in quotations in their Bible? So, it, like, have you ever had somebody give you bad advice, and, and you say, no, I'm doing what the Lord says. How can you say X, Y, or Z to me? That's what he's doing right here. And so what is the advice that he's getting from these counselors of his? Run away. Flee like a bird to your mountain. I think there's a, a hymn that sometimes uh, we've sung like that. I don't know if the hymn uses that properly. I'll have to read the hymn again. Um, but Okay, so good. Flee like a bird to your mountain. What else are they telling David to do? Or why are they telling him to do this? Yeah, like the, the, the arrow is in their bow, their magazine is loaded up, they got the, their AR-15s, like they're, they're ready to kill you right now, David. You've got to get away, and the foundations are ruined, the foundations of society. Everything's crumbling right now, David. Maybe this was written around the time that David was fleeing from Absalom, and, um, or, or maybe another time, I, I'm not sure exactly when this was written, um, but David is saying, no, I'm not going to take refuge in the advice that you guys are giving. I'm going to stay here and do the right thing. Now, um, a couple lessons on when people give you advice. Well-intentioned advice is not always true. You ever had somebody give you advice, and they spoke with a nice voice, and they showed that they loved you, and they cared for you, and all that kind of thing? And they even made like a pretty reasoned argument uh, not all advice that, and I think these people are saying these things to David because they really care about him. But it doesn't mean that you should listen to it. Um, we should also be people who immediately shun poor advice that is not coming from God. And one of the ways that you can know that it's poor advice is it's not centered on the Lord. Like the, what these people are saying in verses 2 and 3, they're not saying anything about trusting in the Lord in the midst of the difficulty. They're just saying just run and get out of there. All right. Um, anything you guys want to say up, 
through verse 3. Do you guys see how David is defying the bad advice that he's been given? All right, a couple, a couple other things about this. If David's not going to flee, uh, we should flee from sin, obviously, but not from responsibility. And if things are a mess, if society's crumbling down right now, then how about this? How about we stay and clean it up and fix the problem? That should be the perspective, but that's not what David's friends are saying here. All right, look at verses 4 through 7. The Lord is in his holy temple... The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteous deeds, the upright shall behold his face. All right. David's reply to these fearful people. Um, what, do you, what do you notice here about David's mindset as opposed to what his counselors are telling him? Yes. Um, do you think, David is, is thinking, God is bigger than whatever it is that I'm going through right now. Uh, and if I meditate on the greatness of God and the greatness of who he is, that puts a lot of things into perspective. And the descriptions that he gives of this Lord who's above everything is that he's in his holy temple. Uh, he dwells in the heavenly realm. He's the one that's the king of the world. And he beholds or he tests people. Yeah, so God's in control. He also tests people. Could God be testing me right now? Maybe is what David is saying. How am I going to handle this difficulty? Um, how does God feel about the wicked? How can, how can these verses say that God hates the wicked when I thought that John 3.16 says that God loves the whole world? How can you get verses like this in the Psalms that say something like that when God is supposed to love everybody? Yes. Um, and I think the punishment, like his wrath is what's being, like God's wrath is upon such people. If they were to repent, would God forgive them? For sure. But, but his hatred or his wrath is against them and it's going to be poured out on these people in that sense, I think is what's going on. Um, and God loves righteous deeds. And so that's the description of the Lord. So here's the question. Why would meditating on God's character help us in times of difficulty? Yeah, like, I, I, I'm defiantly disagreeing with your advice. I'm going to trust in the Lord, and this is the one that I'm calling out to, and good, good. What else, do, how else do you guys think meditating on God's character would help you? And Yeah. You go back to your feelings of what's good in you. Yeah. Yeah, Amy. Yeah, and I think, at least for me, whenever I go through something that's, that's difficult, God's character is one of the easiest things to forget about. You're thinking about the character of that person and, 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 and all these other things. That are, if you just pause for a second and remember, the Lord's in his holy temple. He tests people. He could be using this as a test for me right now to see how I'm going to respond to this. He does hate the wicked. God is going to have justice one day. He loves righteous deeds. I better just focus on responding to this in the right way. This is the Lord that I serve. I'm not going to run. The Lord is going to take care of me. Any other thoughts or comments on any of that? Do you see how this is a lot better than going on a Netflix binge or getting drunk 
or getting high on something. Like, the, the world says you're going through something difficult and just forget about your problems for, for eight hours. And then the Bible says, no, you put the lenses of God's perspective on it. You don't forget what's happening. You learn to look at it the right way that will actually give you peace. David's not writing all these psalms trying to forget everything that's happening. No, he's, he's totally thinking about what's happening, but now doing it from a perspective of how God would see all of this. And that is how you get through your difficulties, not by forgetting everything, because then the problem still comes back. Yeah, Angie? Yes. Yes. Yep, you never actually grow. It's like the guy that I studied with in California, he'd be okay with me sharing this. Um, I, started, I started studying with a guy when I was in California who started smoking marijuana when he was 13 because he saw his brother commit suicide. And so beginning at age, he's going through really difficult things, obviously. Like, we all would have sympathy for him. But starting at age 13, he starts smoking marijuana. We start studying when he's 42. And he's been smoking marijuana for 29 years or whatever that would be. And um, guess what his emotional maturity was? A 13-year-old. Because, yeah, you've gone through difficulties, but you've never learned how to process it. You've never learned how to deal with it. The book of Psalms helps you learn how to deal with difficulties. How to process your difficulties with God. Now, Lord willing, for the rest of these classes, except for maybe one of them. And the material's back there. And these next classes, are, the discussion, the quality of the class is going to really be dependent on how much people prepare for these classes. And how much you're comfortable sharing. But we're going to be asking these questions to the text uh, in every one of these psalms for the rest of the classes. Except for maybe one of them. I already said that. What do you notice from this psalm? What do you wonder about or from this psalm? What does this passage remind you of? Whether it's other passages in the Bible, uh, if it makes you think about Jesus in one way or another, some movie that you've seen, personal stories. I want us to connect what we're seeing in the psalms with other things in the Bible, other things in, in real life. And then fourthly, what do you see from this psalm that you'd like to pray about? So those are going to be the four questions that we ask as we go through these psalms, and the materials back there, read the psalms, they're short, read them multiple times, and just meditate on those questions. And so I look forward to continuing studying through the book of Psalms, and we're going to do it that way. So my plan, though, is for each individual psalm, is I'll give you a brief synopsis of it, and then an outline of the psalm, so you get the big picture of it, and then we'll break it down to those questions. So beginning next Sunday morning, that's how I want to do that. But for now, let's go ahead and conclude this class with a prayer. O oh Lord, our refuge, we thank you that even when so many things around us are falling apart, even when it seems like the foundations of society are falling apart, that we do not need to flee like a bird to the mountain, but Lord, we can be people who, who defy advice like that, that we are people who understand that you will take all the evildoers and hold them to account. We pray, Lord, that you would root out the evil from within us. Please test us and try us so that we can become more pure and holy and more like you. Father, we know that even when we seek to do what's right, the world will not always appreciate that and it will invite people who act as oppressors towards us. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us the strength to rely on you, to handle those things with grace, to handle those things with your perspective. Help us, Lord, as we continue to study the Psalms that we would be people who learn how to actually face difficulties rather than escaping from them. Help us to take to heart the things that we're studying. Thank you for this time together, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.